welcome from the Ann Arbor District Library. Uh, my name is Heidi and I work here at AADL. And um, basically, I'm going to just briefly highlight one related event series that we think you should all check out. It's called The Big Gay Read. Um, and this year the title is Last Night at the Telegraph Club. Uh, author Melinda Lowe will be visiting this Tuesday, 6 p.m. at the Downtown Library. Um, you can find out more about all of our events in brochures that look like this all around the library. And um, one note, there's a Wikipedia editing session following this panel and the library does have some laptops provided in case you would like to make use of that to participate in the session. So just let us know, look for anyone in one of these t-shirts or a library badge will help you out. And with that, I would like to welcome the event organizers. Um, first, I will introduce Jennifer from the University of Michigan Stamps Gallery. Excellent. Thank you, Heidi. Um, and hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Jennifer jacker Com. My pronouns are she, hers, and I'm the Outreach and Public Engagement Coordinator at Stamps Gallery, which is part of the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan. I'm also one of the co-organizers of the event today. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you all here for the sixth annual Ann Arbor Art and Feminism Wikipedia Edit-a-thon. A big thank you to all of our special guests today that are taking part in the panel discussion, Tony, Amelia, Diamond, and Amanda, and a huge thanks to all of you for coming out and to our live streaming audience out there. Um, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that the University of Michigan resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg, the Three Fire Confederacy of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi Nations, as well as the Wyandotte Nation. In concert with this land acknowledgement, we advocate for indigenous struggles against ongoing settler colonization and strive for a decolonized future. Um, for those of you who haven't been to Stamps Gallery before, I just want to tell you a little bit about the gallery space. Um, Stamps Gallery is an incubator and lab for contemporary artists and designers to explore ideas and projects that catalyze social change. Building on the Penny W. Stamps School of Art and Design's strong tradition of excellence, thought leadership, and community engagement, our goal is to develop innovative and scholarly exhibitions, publications, and public programs that foster inclusive platforms for presentation discussion, and inquiry into the urgent questions and concerns of our time. A commitment to social justice shapes our work that we hope inspires new ways of looking, making, and thinking. Every year at the gallery, we present three to four student exhibitions and three to four exhibitions with renowned artists and designers working, working locally, nationally, and internationally. In conjunction with the exhibitions, we host a number of public programs, such as this one, um, and create publications. Currently on view at Stamps Gallery is Envision, the Michigan Artist Initiative, which features the work of artists Backpack Durden, Parisa Gaderi, and Levon Kakafian. That show is up until July 29th, um, and we are actually right around the corner. Stamps Gallery is located right around the corner from Ann Arbor District Library, um, so please stop by and see the show and say hello. Visiting Stamps Gallery is always free and open to the public, and for more information, you can visit our website. Oops, I knew I was going to forget my slides. Um, you can visit our website, which is up there. Um, I want to take a moment to also recognize and thank our event partners and sponsors, which include the University of Michigan Library, the Penny W. Stamp School of Art and Design, the Ann Arbor District Library, the Digital Studies Institute, the Center for the Education of Women, Irma Wyman Program Funds, the University of Michigan Museum of Art, and LSNA Technology Services. Your support make these events possible. Lastly, I want to shout out and send a huge amount of thanks to all the people who worked on this event, and there are many, and I'm, I'm attempting to name every single one of those people. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Um, Anne, Megan, Marisol Tall, Joe, Caitlin, Isabella, Natalie, Tammy Lackis, who is our DJ today, so stick around to hear um, some of her tunes later. Heidi, Sherlana, Emily, and the entire team at the Ann Arbor District Library. Carl, Patrick, and the Michigan Media team. Um, Alana, who is a stamp student who actually designed this year's logo, which you'll see on t-shirts. Um, Megan, Jamie, and Justin, along with other staff, faculty, students, and the incredible volunteers here today who are making this event happen. 
Thank you all. Um, and with that, I am pleased to turn it over to Anne. All right, um, I'm Anne Kong Huen. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Director of Digital Scholarship at the University of Michigan Library. Um, this is our first time hosting this event at AADL, so we're really excited about this collaboration and so thrilled to welcome you all here today. So this event is part of the larger global art and feminism series of Wikipedia edit-a-thons. Um, art and feminism is an international community of artists, of um, activists, Despite its importance, Wikipedia's gender trouble is well documented. In a survey, the Wikimedia Foundation found that less than 10% of its contributors identify as female, and you can imagine it just goes down from there for like trans non-binary folks. And Wikipedia has fewer and less extensive articles on women, trans, non-binary, anyone who doesn't identify as white and male. So when cis and trans women, non-binary people, black, indigenous, and other minoritized communities are not represented in the writing and editing of the 10th most visited site in the world, information gets skewed and misrepresented. So we all lose out on real history. Since 2014, over 20,000 people at more than 1,500 events worldwide have participated in these edit-a-thons. And this has resulted in the creation and improvement of more than 100,000 articles on Wikipedia and its sister projects. Today, we're, you're participating in the sixth annual Art and Feminism um, Wikipedia Edithon. Uh, and this is our fourth working with the Stamps Gallery, and I think actually the second with AADL, but the first here physically. Um, so here are some of our previous logos. We've been hosting them here since 2018. Um, and these are all designed by either uh, Michigan staff, and the last one is by Elena Tran, who is one of our students. Um, we'll start first with a panel of scholars and game makers, activists, artists, who have actively been teaching, critiquing, and pushing against the boundaries and notions of games for years. So I am so grateful that they're all able to join us and have stuck with us this journey. Um, following the panel, we'll all reconvene in the secret lab right next door. Uh, and it's just down the hall for our social Wikipedia editing event. So we'll have snacks. We'll ha we have a giant cake. Please stay and help us eat this cake <laughs> and uh, raffle. Um, and you will have experienced Wikipedians and librarians who can help you and teach you how to edit Wikipedia. Um, so I'm going to hand things over now to Tony, who is our lovely, Tony Bushner, our lovely moderator. Ah. Um, for today's panel, Tony is a lecturer and advisor in the Digital Studies Institute at the University of Michigan. Their research and pedagogy lives at the cross-section of digital humanities, technical writing, and game studies. Their doctoral research was on how board game designers cr create compelling rules documentation and carry out playtesting data collection as part of their iterative design process. Outside of academia, uh, Tony performs live glitch art for ch chiptune and other experimental electronic music arts under the stage name Donut? Donut? Uh, they'll be introducing our speakers and then engaging them in a dialogue before we open up the floor to questions from the audience. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Anne. All right, so for today, we have three lovely presenters. Um, Diamond Beverly Porter, pronouns she, her, hers, is a game developer, artist, critical maker, and incoming assistant professor at digital technology and culture at Washington State University. She has an MFA from the University of Texas at Dallas. Diamond creates th the work she wanted to see when she was younger. As a game designer and artist, her work is colorful, character-driven, and reflective. It also centers on her personal experiences navigating the many spaces she inhabits and seeks to capture the nuances of her intersecting identities. Diamond's most recent publication can be found in Hyperhiz and is titled Blurred, The Exploration of Blackness in Gaming Spaces, Fan Interpretations, and Creation of Counterpublics. 
Her most recent game project is Affirmation 2.0, and it explores the affordance of a digital game as a commun communally situated coping mechanism and critical making, yes, critical making technology for black women and children, and complicates the player's knowledge of the self and work as a flexible artifact that facil facilitates critical making, reflection, and self-care. Uh, we have Amanda Phillips, pronouns they, he, she, uh, and Amanda is an associate professor of English, Film and Media Studies, Women and Gender Studies, and American Studies at Georgetown University. Amanda is the author of Gamer Trouble, Feminist Confrontations in Digital Culture, as well as co-editor of the Queer Trans Digital Book Series with NYU Press. The Antares, oh, I'm going to butcher this, <laughs> uh, the Trasse human Humanities, <laughs> Okay, so sorry. <laughs> special issue on critical game <laughs> studies. Uh, and the game studies special issue on queerness in video games. Their other publications can be found in Romchip, Feminist Media Histories, Queer Game Studies, Games and Culture, Digital Creativity, Debates in the Digital Humanities, and the Fembot Collective. Previously, Amanda was the immersed postdoctoral postdoctoral fellow in the Mod Lab at the University of California, Davis. Uh, he also served as chair of the American Studies Association Digital Humanities Caucus and were involved in the Transform DH collective efforts to encourage and highlight critical cultural studies work in digital humanities projects. And finally, we have Amelia Yang, uh, pronouns she, her, hers, Ella. Uh, who is an assistant professor of art and design and anti-racism by design at the Stamp School of Art and Design here at the University of Michigan. She is an artist, activist, designer, researcher, and creator of the interactive web series Downtown Browns. Her art practice utilizes expanded forms of digital media, XR, transmedia, web, interactive, films, archives, performance, games, and public interventions for the creation of community-based feminist anti-racist and transformative justice projects. Her research explores the role of memory, violence, emotions, performance, and participation in the political imagination. Her more recent project, AMA No Olivia, uh, Memory Museum Against Impunity, is a transmedia and community memory museum that explores participatory forms of mediation and design for remembering victims of state violence in her home country, Nicaragua. Uh, first up for our presentations, we will have Amanda Phillips. I turn it over to you. Okay. Um, thank you so much uh, to Anne and Jennifer for organizing this great event, um, as well as the folks at the Ann Arbor District Library, all of the volunteers. This is extremely exciting um, to be here. I want to say that my history with the art and, art and feminism Wikipedia edit-a-thons goes back quite a long ways. And actually with Anne in particular, we've been doing Wikipedia edit-a-thons for a very long time together, um, going back at least 10 years, I think, um, to our days in Southern California. Uh, so very excited to be here. Um, I also apologize, I'm a little bit sniffly. Um, it was very remarkable as soon as my plane landed and they opened the vents up to the Michigan air, I started sneezing and I have not stopped. Um, so Michigan is, is really, uh, really assaulting me right now. Um, but I'm nevertheless happy, happy to be here. Um, I'm here to talk about Embracing Gamer Trouble, which is the, the name of my book. I'm not actually going to talk about my book that much. Uh, I want to talk about uh, trouble a little bit and how to survive and thrive in hostile territory. Um, so I grew up a gamer. Right, uh, and this meant a lot of different things for me. Um, it meant, of course, fun. Uh, video games are great fun, especially when you're a kid. Um, they're still fun now that I'm an adult, but they are a little bit of a different kind of fun, and I find that as I get older, that fun and my engagement with them changes a lot. Um, it meant exploration, right? It means fantasy worlds, it means all sorts of wild territories, and like back in the 90s when I was growing up, um, the, the graphics that we had were not as sophisticated as they are today, but they still really opened up my imagination to other possible worlds, and that's always very exciting. Um, being a gamer meant companionship, 
right? It was a way that I connected with other young people, um, especially with my brother. He and I played together a lot. Um, and it's the way that I keep in touch with a lot of friends that are flung far across the country now today. And it meant escape. Right? Um, as you can imagine, I was a queer kid growing up in a conservative family in a conservative part of the country. Um, and, you know, games give you an opportunity to play with identity, it gives you an opportunity to play with power, it gives you an opportunity to really escape into a place where you are the center of the world in some ways. Um, but that's a very, um, it's, it's a place of power for young people, right, to, to think about um, themselves in new ways. And I think both my co-panelists are going to speak to that and how that, that plays out in their work. Um, I had, um, and frankly, I continue to have fairly lowbrow taste in games um, <laughs> and in entertainment generally. Um, but as I developed a more sophisticated understanding of the world as I grew up, I could no longer really ignore what was happening around me, right? Um, the fact that a lot of games had really problematic representations, which I was totally happy to ignore, right? Of people of color, of women, of queer folks. Um, part of getting swept up in that fantasy, right, is having to ignore the, the sort of like less tasteful parts of it. Um, so what do you do um, when you look around and you realize the thing that has sustained you, that has brought you joy for so many years, and as, again, in, in this sort of like growing up narrative, uh, sort of understanding the world in new ways, what do I do when I reach this moment of, oh man, <laughs> this is really problematic and I still really love it and I don't know how to handle all of these sort of like contradictory feelings. Um, even beyond the fantasies of gaming, what do we do about the environmental devastation, right, that is wrought by the tech industry generally um, and that is inextricably tied to these technologies that we love so much? Um, so lots of complicated feelings, um, including a feeling of not wanting to let that go. Um, and so that's where gamer trouble comes in for me. I wrote my first book um, to make sense of some of these contradictions, to untangle the gamer troubles around me and to think through ways of naming them, describing them, and responding to them. So the subtitle is Feminist Confrontations in Digital Culture. Um, and for me, gamer trouble embodies the way in which we struggle with games on all levels, right? Actually playing a game is struggling with a game. Um, trying to come to terms with games as a feminist is a struggle with a game. There are lots of struggles between gamers, uh, right? I think it's, <laughs> there's a reason, right, that we turn comments off for the live stream on this video, because um, feminist in, in gaming spaces is not always a welcome term. Um, so I was looking at trouble as a method, uh, right? So as a, as a grad student, um, who's coming out of, like, I was a first-generation college student. I did not come up in any sort of, like, academic lineage whatsoever. I had super lowbrow taste. I always felt like I was doing academia wrong. Um, and so trouble for me um, was also about that method of figuring things out, of being sloppy, but also about not taking academia so seriously um, that, that we sort of, like, continue to crystallize its very problematic um, parts. Um, trouble as a genealogy. So these images here represent different places that I pulled notions of trouble from. So of course on the left hand side we have um, US Representative John Lewis uh, who is famous for coining the term make good trouble, right? Um, so trouble is about resisting um, oppression, resisting um, the system if you will, um, and, and sort of like making trouble uh, to make change. Judith Butler um, in academia famously wrote the, uh, the book Gender Trouble, um, in which uh, she explores gender as performance and gender as something that we are all struggling with um, and that we are all sort of figuring out our gender both um, against systems of oppression but also really within uh, normalizing systems of gender. Uh, the third image is a representation of the feminist Killjoy, um, which is a figure that comes to me through Sarah Ahmed, um, who's a queer woman of color theorist, um, who again asks us to embrace the ways that feminist critique um, often inserts bad feelings into otherwise harmonious spaces and that we should really um, embrace that. And then finally, there's Donna Haraway, another academic, staying with the trouble, um, making kin in the Cthulhu scene. Um, and what I really found um, compelling about this book is that uh, Donna Haraway really encourages us not to think about um, what she calls uh, the Edenic past, so this sort of like um, uh, 
like fantasy of the past as like really good and that we're slowly sort of like slumping towards this like terrible ending um, of disaster, right, that the world is headed towards, but also not to think about the future as utopian and that we really need to stay stuck in the mess that the world is now um, and to not look too far forward or back, um, but to really stay with the trouble um, right now to figure things out. So I found that very um, sort of compelling. Um, I'm not going to talk about, again, I'm not going to talk too much about the book. Um, here are some of the case studies I used um, in figuring out what gamer trouble meant for me. Um, so Dick Wolves and Killjoys, I was thinking about harassment events um, in gaming culture and how um, those sort of expose uh, the ways in which feminism is always cast out of the norms of not just fan conversations, but academic conversations as well. Um, I wrote a little bit about um, character anima animation and customization, so the way that video game interfaces allow us to change um, avatar faces or customize them actually tells us a lot about developer assumptions about what constitutes human, what constitutes gender, um, and what constitutes race, right? There are a lot of really interesting 19th century notions of what bodies are that get reinserted um, into high-tech technologies. Gender power in the gamut gaze is a, is a chapter that's about Portal and Bayonetta and asks sort of what um, constitutes a feminine or a feminist hero. Um, and then I wrote a chapter about Mass Effect um, and the, the figure of Femshep, who is the female version of the main hero. Um, and again, asking these questions about what does feminism look like in games? Um, but we're here today in the middle of Pride Month, so happy Pride, everyone. Um, or as this artist, um, Doe Antlers, who's a, a trans furry artist on Twitter that you can follow, um, made this excellent burning unicorn figure that says, we called off pride, now it's Gay Wrath Month. Um, and I just find this a, a super amazing and inspirational picture, right? Um, so we're in a, this moment of trouble, right, in which the trans community in particular, but the queer community generally, is under attack. Um, my super cute jumper that I'm wearing today is one of the extremely innocuous pieces of clothing that was banned from Target's Pride line after right-wing um, activists sort of started harassing the company. Um, so we're seeing a lot of places where we're leading up to an election. Trans and queer folks um, are one of the many communities that are sort of like put onto display here and put into the middle of these conflicts um, to drum up voter enthusiasm, right? So in this moment of hostility, I want to offer a toolkit for folks traveling through hostile territory. Um, and I hope people recognize the screen from the original Legend of Zelda, um, where you are offered your first sword by a nameless, <laughs> bearded person in a cave. It's dangerous to go alone and take this. Um, this is my offering to Cheering Crans folks this wrathful Pride Month. Um, and some of the things I've learned from embracing the trouble um, and sort of lean leaning into being a troublemaker in gaming. Tool number one know your history. So this is a picture of the Rainbow Arcade exhibit that uh, occurred in the Schulz Museum in Berlin in 2018. Um, it was, as far as I know, the first museum exhibit to cover queer history in video games. Um, Caper and the Castro was created in 1989. This is the earliest known LGBTQ game um, created by lesbian CM Ralph as charity wear to raise money for AIDS research. You play as a ca character named Tracker McDyke, a private detective looking for her missing drag queen friend, Tessie LaFemme. Um, and one of the reasons I like to show this example and that it's really wonderful, you can actually play this now um, on the Internet Archive. They have, made a, they have resurrected the, uh, the files and made a playable version. Is a lot of people think that like, queer folks in games is a super new phenomenon, right? Um, and this is the first exclusively LGBTQ game, but queer folks have been in video games even earlier than this, right? Um, and this is early history for video games. Jacob Gabry will, wrote a great series of articles called A Queer History of Computing, where he covers um, famous uh, gay men in the history of de the development of the computers and makes the argument that their identities actually um, play into some of the, um, or, or, or sort of like, make computers queer at their very foundation. Wit Powell, um, 
does really extensive history work on trans um, folks in the history of computing as well. So here we have Daniel Bunton, Danielle Bunton Berry, Catherine Mataga, Jamie Faye Fenton, um, who were pioneers in uh, the early history of computing. And these, of course, are the hidden figures, Christine Darden, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Dorothy Vaughn, um, who were un uncovered recently um, in the, the, with the uh, movie, right, Hidden Figures movie. Um, and these types of historical projects make powerful claims that though marginalized communities are erased from contemporary understanding of fields like math, computation, and video games, we all share in the foundation of these important technologies. Um, and scholars who are doing this historical work point towards the way that computing and gaming have always been queer, trans, black, brown, and more, all the way to their bones. Tool number two, imagine otherwise. Um, how many folks in here write fan fiction, do fan work, etc.? I always do this with students and then I tell everyone to close their eyes and raise their hand again and always many more hands go up. <laughs> um, while I was writing Gamer Trouble, I was delighted to find a video created by fans that retold the story of Mass Effect 2 by constantly switching out the faces of the lead character, Commander Shepard. To me, this was an expression of unity and difference, a way for Mass Effect fans to rally together around their own customized versions of the game's hero. Um, each unique face represents someone's own version of themselves as Commander Shepard. Um, there are lots of different ways that fan works um, engage in this. This is some research done on um, Archive of Our Own, which is a very well-known uh, fan repository online uh, of looking at the way trans characters come up in fan fiction. And this is actually one of my favorites. This is a cosplay Harry Potter video done by um, a, a cast full of trans folks um, in kind of a direct response to J.K. Rowling's famous transphobia. Um, and these are ways that fans and folks imagine otherwise within these texts. Um, Tool number three is find alternatives. And I've been told that I'm out of time, so I'm gonna go through these really quickly. Um, so Squinky, uh, these are some game developers that are, that are trans and do really cool work. Non-binary game designer whose work explores soft masculinities, me mental health, social awkwardness, and music. Here are some of my favorite games of theirs, Dominique Pamplemousse, Rest, Rest, Convalescence, in which you literally have to rest to recover from surgery and do nothing, which is actually very difficult. Um, and Second Puberty, which they wrote about their uh, experience with transition. Misha Cardenas is a trans Latina whose work explores hybrid game forms, trans of color poetics, environmental devastation, and decolonial methods. Um, her games integrate dance, poetry, and speculative fiction. Um, and here are some examples of her work as well, also writing from her own trans experience. And finally, Maddie Bryce, who's a black trans woman whose games explore everyday experience, the body, and empathy. Um, and one of the things I really love about the work that she's done is on the left is my Nietzsche, um, which was made in RPG Maker. It was about the day in the, a day in the life of a black trans woman, which she then turned into um, this, experience, this game called Empathy Machine, um, in which in response to the reception of games like My Nietzsche, where people played it and were like, oh, all of a sudden I understand what it means to be a black trans woman. She was like, no, actually, you're not having sort of meaningful experiences. Here's a more up close and personal way where you have to actually engage in a really intimate encounter with Maddie by touching her body in order to control the game, right? So calling in to question those assumptions. Last tool that I'll leave you with is break stuff, make stuff. And this is actually my last slide. Um, I've been teaching folks without coding skills, right? I'm an English professor, um, how to design games for over 10 years. These are some of the tools that you can use if you have zero coding experience whatsoever to actually make really fun and really functional games. So little big planet RPG maker, um, uh, top right is RenPy. Um, this is uh, Bitsy on the bottom left, which the students love right now. Um, I highly recommend you check out Bitsy. You can make really cool stuff. Twine, um, where you make interactive text-based fiction. And then, of course, Minecraft. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your time here. Hello, I suppose it's my turn now. Um, so, hi, I'll move the slide. I'm Diamond, uh, and today I'm just gonna work you, or walk you through my kind of creative praxis, a little bit about some of my game projects, and as you can tell from the title, a lot of my games deal with like healing and liberation, spe specifically through critical making and techno culture, which I'll explain. 
Um, so yeah, table of contents, how I'm going to work through it. So one, I'm just going to talk about my work interests. It was mentioned a little bit earlier that I make the games I would have wanted when I was younger. So what does that mean? So I'll work through that. Some kind of frameworks and some of my other kind of research and how that kind of ties into my own kind of creative practice because everything I do is a little bit intertwined. And then of course my past projects and then my current projects. So my kind of research interests, so of course these kind of three categories I feel kind of sum up what I kind of like to do in my creative praxis. Uh, black culture representation, a lot of the times uh, my work I kind of pull from my own personal experiences of course. So that does include like black culture and I want and need to see myself represented in media the way I would have wanted when I was younger. So there weren't a lot of like of those um, positive examples of like a young black girl or just like an older black woman in like media of course in games in film those types of things so that's what I really strive to do with my work but then I also try to uh, go deeper and kind of understand how do we use technology and um, kind of build cultures around them and specifically how do we as like black women do that and then of course like how does that go deeper into like fandom studies how does that go deeper into like adding games into that so intertwining those then of course my kind of main basis and entryway point into a lot of my work is narrative and game design so those are generally what my projects kind of revolve around some of my frameworks and re, um, kind of influences. So I always like to start with this um, because they are like the foregrounding of what my work I want to do. So of course, first up is Adrienne Marie Brown. A lot of her work really deals with um, understanding uh, like technology, what does it mean to inter interact with that, critical making, how does it um, all kind of work together. And then of course, he's Shauna Gray delving into um, blackness and games and technology, as well as Andre Brock doing that through um, the kind of technoculture lens. And then of course, the middle column uh, is the three people that I always like to include because they're my entryway into a lot of like media. So first, of course, Octavia E. Butler, who would, this is the first uh, science fiction novel that I ever read. That's like, oh, this is like a black woman. She's going on a narrative and she's like, real cool. I want to do that. So like it was just, it was a great moment. Uh, and then, of course, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, whose work um, is just very impactful. Um, in my mother's gardens, I reread that book so many times just because it's a really pivotal point in my own research and of course I also have some like Keith Haring, Jordan Peele, Kara Walker as more influences for, like aesthetic but also um, the way that they tell narratives and things like that. And then just some of the um, kind of key points of my work that I already kind of mentioned a little bit but of course what is critical making? Critical making in my practice is just defined as engaging with technology and mediums that are then kind of combined through critical thinking and often uh, extends the social reflection. So I'm always really interested in not only like the end products, so I'll show like a game project, like the aesthetics are nice, like I really like the colors and stuff, but what was I really interrogating with like, okay, so I have a coding day and then I have like, I have to write the narrative day and then like, I think I need a rest day. So how do you actually like deal with those types of things when you're building a game or like, Making a project. And then uh, the other two are black techno culture, which uh, pulls from Andre Bach's uh, centering of blackness to kind of um, understand the matrix that is um, basically just foregoing white experiences. So when we talk, talk about technology, when we talk about culture, foregrounding whiteness isn't the goal. You want to um, be able to encounter these other ways that we deal with technology without having to center white experiences. And then, of course, design justice, exploring how um, marginalized communities utilize design to kind of dism dismantle structure in inequality. Um, so just exploring the interconnectedness of community and what does that mean in the technical space. So then next, my uh, research. So I have um, my presentation, Shame Works, How Game Developers and Fan Communities Renegotiate Representation and Content in Video Games. So I was really interested in like the modding community because one of my you know, standpoints in my research is representation. So how does that feature, how does that work in uh, modding? I specifically looked at Sims 4 as well as Animal Crossing. This was around the time where they had the... Um, I don't think it was a DLC, but they had like an update or something and they had like the black hairstyles behind like a, it was either like a pay thing or like you have to level up in the game. I was like, well, that's not fair. I want to have an afro in the game. Um, so that was what that one explored. And then my recent article blurred the exploration of blackness in gaming spaces and fan interpretations and creation of counterpublics. Then kind of went past that and started to uh, delve into, okay, so how do we build representation, like identity in like, um, fan fiction spaces, fan fictions that often center like gaming type of stuff. Uh, and then finally, of course, one of the games I'll present today as well is Affirmations 2.0, The Politics of Liberation, Exploration of Healing in Digital Games. So past projects. So 
And one of the first projects that I did was a taunting kind of creative writing story. It's about five minutes. It's available uh, on Itch.io, of course. And I was really interested in, like, the narrative here. I was interested in, like, the kind of witness viewer and playing with the relationships between I'm playing the game, but then is the adversary me or am I the adversary? So really play with, like, what, how are we working with the narrative in this game? Um, and then I'm also really interested, of course, in, like, making sure the characters reflect... Um, me in some type of way, so that's what's shown in the screenshot. And then the next um, larger scale project that I did was called Paper Revisiting Identity and Community Through Game Design, and I made this in Unreal Engine 4, and I really was uh, interested in revisiting these types of like, communities that I grew up in. So throughout the game, it's uh, the premise is you're trying to find batteries for our RC car race uh, that you can participate in at the end of the game, um, and then you're just running around all these different levels and towns, but the really interesting thing that I really wanted the player to experience is talking with like the MP NPCs. So all the NPCs are like people I encountered when I was growing up or like people that have significance to me as well as all the different locations because I'm uh, from Dallas so but I moved around like the Metroplex area while I was growing up so there's like little parts of like South Dallas and like Mesquite and like these little towns and like communities I built while I was like moving around in the game. So it was kind of like the first like love letter to myself as like a game that I really liked. Um, I'll play a few. Ooh. Oh no, oh no, okay, well, hopefully the other one will play. It's available to play. Um, so then, next, aha. My current projects. Um, so the current project is Affirmations 2.0. Uh, here's like a short blurb that talks about um, the kind of premise of it. So I made uh, Affirmations 2.0 or 1.0 as like the first iteration and the basis of the game was when I was uh, in 2019, I was first coming into grad school. I had all these like insecurities and like I'm a first generation college student. It was the first time I had never been without my sister. So I didn't have like a real strong community. So I had all these negative thoughts and I thought, well, how can I deal with this? So I decided to visualize my like kind of process of how I deal with negative thoughts. So this Affirmations 1.0 is like the digitization of that. So when I have a negative thought or had, uh, I'd see that negative thought as like a parallel version of myself and I'd go, okay, I'm gonna fight that version until like they leave me alone. So this game is just like a punch em, hack em up kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I know, like a kind of, moment happening, uh, but it was a really interesting uh, moment that led to me making Affirmations 2.0 because Affirmations uh, 1.0, you really were just kind of finding that parallel version of yourself, but what does it mean when we enact violence on ourselves or sometimes um, kind of situations that we can't really control? So then uh, the kind of pre-production development and post-production phrase, phases, ooh, words. Uh, so one, influences and frameworks. Uh, just gonna talk a little bit about that. My methodology, where the game mechanics, and then of course the reflection and like the next steps, which I'm currently working on. So I situate play and the art of developing a game as a kind of intervention to kind of problematize what we come to understand as like legitimate, as well as to disrupt cultural understandings that center whiteness by creating gaming experiences that are often culturally unaccessible to whiteness. So play as a technology for intervention in this way interrogates power structures, cultural knowledge, and ways of understanding. So of course, like I mentioned, uh, games, I always create the things I want to see, and it was really important to me for this game to have these uh, really personal experiences um, really work with um, my idea of like what are the bounds of a game, how can the ga a game be accessed, but also not try to translate that so that uh, the audience is like, oh yeah, I understand what it means to be like a little black girl playing this game. That wasn't the like approach at all. Um, so I was really interested in just interrogating like the power structures, what does it mean to develop a game for like black women, black children, uh, black people. So then uh, next are the three kind of levels. So the entryway point into the game uh, is like a hub world, and the hub worlds where you access all three of these levels, they're all run very linearly. Uh, the first level uh, was modeled after like an elementary school I went to. The main objective, of course, was just trying to get a tardy slip, making sure that um, you can run away from your kind of negative thought enemies. Uh, so the game pretty much had the same negative thought enemies, but the way that you deal with them differed drastically. Uh, so then the second level, of course, was a kind of neighborhood setup. So you can go to like the convenience store, you can go play on the playground, you can do your homework. 
Uh, but once again, uh, kind of going towards community to handle those kind of negative thoughts that you encounter instead of the option to hit them or like an act of violence. And then finally, the third level is uh, a kind of family barbecue. And once again, uh, kind of pointing you towards talking with uh, the NPCs, trying to talk with the enemies instead of um, trying to just like conquer them and get to the next level. So then post production. So um, the game in short is about healing and care and exploration of community. You do have the option to of course like fight the negative thoughts, but I try and orient it so that it's not your only option when you're dealing with these kind of thoughts. Uh, and of course, in healing, it's never just the one way. So it, the game is meant to be replayed. Um, so then next, I'm going to go ahead and show the short trailer for it. Hopefully it plays. It's okay. It's available on Itch.io if you'd like to watch the trailer. <laughs> I know, it's okay. Technology, right? Okay, then next slide. I'll talk while it connects. Um, so the next steps for Affirmations 2.0 is uh, I'm actually working with the South Dallas Cultural Center. We'll be building an arcade uh, kind of shell so that the game can have like a living spot so that like the people who I made this game for can like play it. So it'll be like a living installation of sorts. And then um, I'm also, oh no, okay. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. Um, I'm also looking at working and making like workshops to like, um, make their own games that kind of have similar ideas. All right, current projects. Uh, so after Affirmations 2.0, of course, I'm still working on it. The next project, that's Project A, I don't have a title for it yet, um, but I'm really interested in uh, kind of digitizing some of um, the games I played when I was younger. So if anyone knows, girlsgogames.com, I used to play it a whole bunch when I was younger. It was like my, oh yeah, this is great, this is my game I'm gonna play after like my homework and stuff. Uh, so this game is uh, kind of, going through employment like materiality, technoculture, identity building, and specifically taking a kind of digital game, a game that's often like, you know, kind of like a dress up game and interrogating, okay, so how do we build identity? How can we like at like another layer? What does it mean to actually have to like print out the thing and like replace the uh, kind of clothes and then um, build identity that way, even though it started as this kind of digital game. Uh, so I'm really interested in seeing how that turns out. I'm still in the production phases of it. And then, of course, my current project is Project B, and uh, it's kind of examining the relationship between produ productivity apps, uh, especially in 2020. These are like super, super prevalent. Uh, so what does it mean to kind of like try and gamify some like parts of life? Do they need to be gamified? Um, and I'm building it in Twine um, and also still in the kind of early phases of like, production, um, but really interested in seeing where these like projects lead, I suppose. And... I think that's it. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emilia Yang. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm also super excited to be among all these beautiful speakers. Um, from my experience, I, I have been able to make a reading of the world in which I place myself at the intersections of oppressions of a young cisgender, queer woman, mixed race, what they call mestiza, uh, with white Taiwanese and indigenous descent from Central America. And I was raised by a semi -urban, in a semi-urban environment by an artist and single mother. So because of this reading, I have garnered a trans-feminist consciousness. And Nicaragua is the land of my ancestors, but because of exile and political violence, Costa Rica has become my second home, and now the U.S., Michigan, the Ann Arbor, <laughs> the lands of the Anishinaabe are my third home. Um, so my journey started as an activist, and my role in movements I have been part has been finding ways to collaborate and gather stories and share resources. Um, so then I moved into media creation and got bitten by the possibility of using fiction to kind of like push and organize against what's possible. I'm really interested in how 
critical, feminist, anti-racist, and decolonial transmedia storytelling, and new media can foster social justice and civic engagement. And I call it transmedia because I've used, um, as Tony said, a lot of different things, websites, documentaries, fictions, urban interventions to engage participants in political action. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples of projects that I've done based in the US and in Nicaragua. So uh, similar to all the speakers here, I have tried to craft media productions and analysis about the things I want the most and experience the least, one that centers marginalized minority groups and their experience, questions dominant narratives through alternative voices, and sees the world with a historicized memory informed by the inequalities of power and knowledge. So I was the creator of Downtown Browns, an interactive web series that won um, the Diversity Challenge at Tribeca Film Festival, and it uses interactivity to represent the decisions we have to make as women of color in relation to microaggressions and uh, other forms of discrimination. So it's kind of, you know, you have to act quick sometimes in this, <laughs> when these things happen. Uh, so you follow three characters. One is Miranda, who faces the highs and lows of high school as an immigrant in, Latina in Los Angeles. Fatih, who's a quick-witted Middle Eastern nursing student on a walk to get medicine for her sister and her path gets complicated. And then Yitunde, who's a pop culture enthusiast, certified nerd, um, and she's going through her first review since her promotion at a Venice tech company. And this was before Black Mirror, Bandersnatch, and many other interactive films that have happened. So I'm gonna show you the trailer. Hopefully it will play. We're having tech issues today. Oh, it didn't play. It didn't play. Okay, <laughs> you can find it online too. Uh, <laughs> it's on Echo and um, the, the group that uh, I made it with, I collaborated, it was like a very intersectional group. So uh, each one of us both gather our own experience to make it and we also gather like real life events to make it. I was also the producer of Tracking Ida which was an award-winning educational alternate reality game created by Luciani C., who's a professor at UC Davis, and inspired by the pioneer investigative journalism of Ida B. Wells. So in this game, players uncover Wells' crusade against lynching and use her strategies to investigate communities' responses to police and vigilante killings today. So I collaborated with a majority black interdisciplinary team and piloted the game in Kindrew School in um, Kindrew High School in Watts in Los Angeles, and I produced the community engagement part of this project, and we also embedded a component for black and brown students from Watts to gain a historical contextualization and media production skills. And it aims to spark interest in the stories of black resistance, but more importantly, to create like a personal connection to these stories by making history come alive. So the game is really hands-on. Uh, the players get to touch historical artifacts like a typewriter and a phonograph, things that you don't get to experience that much and every day. Um, you listen to Ida's uh, voice through a phonograph and interact with a personal narrative. So it immerses the players in a story that connects the past and the present and is relevant to everyday life in their neighborhood. I'm gonna go slower, I'm going really fast. Okay, on 2017, <laughs> uh, after Trump's election, I was a fellow for Metabolic Studio, a special, a special project in animating the archives of the Women's Building, uh, which was um, this big project that hosted a wave of feminist art making in 1970s in Los Angeles. And we were inspired by a group there that were called the Sisters of Survival. And they were a performance collective that dressed as col in colorful non-habits to fight for nuclear armament. So we used their story to create like a modern day version. And I created a futuristic alternate reality story with an interactive performance game about trans feminist hackers called Hackers of Resistance or Whores. <laughs> and it's conceived as an activist performance art group first. And we wrote a story about what women of color trans feminist hackers would fantasize doing um, hacking the government and unveiling explicit discrimination, basically. And the world building presents a speculative hyper-reality hyper that uses shimmery neon style, socially aware comedy, and DIY charm to address the Syrian concerns like the fate of minorities in the hands of Trump administration. And we use speculative design to narrative production that combines informed um, hypothetical extrapolations of emerging technologies 
into with a deep consideration of the cultural landscape in which they will be deployed to speculate on future product systems or services. So taking place in an alternate universe, this hyper-immersive, hyper multi-sensory speculative world manifested through an online archive, which is wearehorse.xyz, I'll put it there, a traveling performance art piece revolving an interactive game-driven installation based in the whorehouse, aka our secret li li lair, and inspiring theater of the oppressed, the whorehouse comrades are called to up, uh, upon to aid a whore sister organization that is called Marias Clandestinas, that advocates the right of abortion, reproductive justice, and public health in the face of government suppression. It's really hard when what you speculate comes to reality. <laughs> uh, so people entered the space um, and became um, whores and took the characters. And the installation, visitors were free to rom um, the horse makeshift hacker then, where environmental storytelling provides a trans-feminist take on online security, community resource resources, and D DIY, but we use DIWO, do it with others, experiments. Uh, so cybersecurity labs, um, anti-facial recognitions, anti-surveillance, biohacking, 3D printable abortion kits that we made in collaboration with this or other organization that I also made up. I'll tell a little bit more about. Uh, and um, hack dildos and social engineering things, different weird things. And we were able to present it in different uh, interesting places like art galleries, new media festivals, and game spaces. Um, sometimes we were placed to next to like Call of Duty or things like that. It was really weird. We were talking about infiltration. <laughs> but it was really interesting to see how people from different backgrounds would interact with the work because, you know, like game people want to break stuff and art people don't want to touch the stuff. So we were trying to like, <laughs> uh, yeah. And we were also doing like site specific. Um, public interventions at the previous institution I was uh, before, basically unveiling the history of one of the presidents was in, um, like a supporter of eugenics and didn't support like Japanese students. So we were trying to like kind of like unveil this history. And there's a trailer there that apparently is not playing. It's not playing. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so you don't get to see the cool video, but you can find it at wearehorse.xyz. You can see all like the all the things that we did. So it's like a, the archive of the project, and the horse is like a spin-off of Maria's Clandestinas, which was a do it with others, a speculative design project of 3D printed abortion kits. And the project used queer decolonial feminist frameworks to speculate how 3D printed could be used to provide access to clandestine abortion kits where abortion is banned. And this, respro this project responded to the fact that both my collaborator, uh, who's Iranian, and me were from con are con from countries where abortion is completely banned. And also the wave of regression of women rights in the US and the rates of the world. And it included the creation of an active online support network and a number of open source mass customized tools. And it is interesting that I was also part of this support networks in Nicaragua and Costa Rica. So this was kind of like a technological iteration of this. And it was part of the Additivist Cookbook edited by Morashin Alehari and Daniel Rourke, as well as um, as part of this um, section that was called Subalternate Realities, curated by Brown Tourash. And the Additivist Cookbook is a compendium of imaginative, provocative works over 100 world-leading artists, activists, and theorists, and it contains 3D objects and files, critical text, templates, recipes, impractical designs and methodologies for living in the most contradictory of time. And there was another project that dealt with abortion in the book. Uh, they would do it creating a contraption with things that you would find in the hardware, and we had like a whole conversation in the book that you can read about it um, there. Shifting gears, I'm just going to tell you like my last project, uh, which is very different from the others. Um, in 2018, like countless Nicaraguan and Central American people, I was a victim of state violence, which came to me in a personal and devastating way when paramilitaries linked to the Nicaraguan government extrajudicially executed my uncle, Vicente Rapacholi, on June 26 near our family home. So in the brutes of middle repression censorship at grief, I gather with victims of state violence to create a participatory transmedia museum, archive, exhibition, and interactive art book, and future-facing reimaginings of our present. 
And to tell you just briefly of like the situation there is that one of the things, the most cruel things that the government did was the denial of the existence of victims of state violence and of course the responsibility upon their deaths. Official media created a, uh, a narrative that dehumanized protesters and they also engaged in digital warfare and abuse using troll farms and different things. And there's also a violent dispute over public spaces that prevents the construction of memory marks or memorials in the urban space. And in re response to the oppression phase, the families of the victims created an organization called Asociación Madres de Abril, Association Mothers of April. In Spanish, its acronym is AMA, which means love. And I'm part of this organization, and our main objective is fighting together for truth and justice. And motivated by this objective, I, I cons and also by the objective of constructing memory of the events for future generations, I created this museum. It's called AMA in Olvida, Museum of Memory Against Impunity, and it was created with a human rights participatory approach in which members of the association assume an essential role in the design, collection of information, and presentation while we're in mourning and state repression continues. I had the privilege to direct this project with the support of the Nicaraguan Academy of Science, the Nicaraguan Center for Human Rights, and a multidisciplinary amazing technical team that included sociologists, architects, human rights defenders, psychologists, artists, developers, designers, and archivists. And I'm gonna tell you very briefly how we made it, the research that took place. Uh, we held open discussions to conceptualize memory, and we uh, recollected the information of the events in two parts. One of them, the victims uh, drew map. I'm gonna go quickly. <laughs> I know that I have two minutes. Uh, and narrated specific facts and circumstances of the events. And then, because we're talking about information justice, I thought this was interesting. We translated the, the maps into GIS information, into geographic information system in order to create collective territorial maps and learn about the repression. And in the second moment, we held individual sessions that consisted of interviews and photographic archive and memory objects. And we usually interviewed two or three relatives. And as you can see, this labor was embraced mostly by women, and we heard about the multiple violences they faced. And they also challenged the races, classes, uh, society of Nicaragua, and the impossibility for them to have like a social and political role. And we designed the museum, carry out on the research we wanted to represent, the aesthetics. And this is how people remember in Nicaragua, we use altars. So we did a website that has all the information of the victims, an installation, and the installation had to close. So we created this interactive book with the intention of translating the museum. And in, with the book, you can also access 3D objects of the victims and create altars that we place in the place, in highly policed places where people were killed and also outside. And just to wrap up, um, this is my new project that I'm working on and it's just shining a light of how women, specifically Central American women, are confronting violence with innovative forms of resistance and the imaginaries of the future that emerge from these interventions. Thank you so much. <laughs> And um, hopefully, too, maybe after after the discussion, we can um, try to get the videos working so that we can watch some of those videos because that would be great. They were working before. They were working before when we tested. <laughs> Okay, so um, to start us off, all of your presentations uh, dealt in some fashion with interactivity or play, um, and so I wanted to open up some space for you each to talk about um, your relationship with play and your pedagogy, your scholarship, your art, um, and what, what play means to you personally. Okay. Hello. Okay. Yeah, it's on. So yeah, I guess I'll start us off. Um, so play to me, um, it's a lot of things. I feel like it's like playing with like the material, playing with like the technology. So 
my always example is whenever I first played Zelda, the first thing I always do is just like run off a cliff and be like, can I die here? Um, so, <laughs> so I'm always like curious about like, what can I do? What can't I do? Where are the bounds? And that's like for any like medium, any material that I have, but also being in conversation uh, with the work. So if I'm reading a fan fiction, there's like, oh yeah, this is written great. Or like, maybe this isn't the best written, but then like, what is it saying? What like is underneath like the like narrative? What's underneath the plot? So always being kind of like curious about like the inner things and like the kind of systems that are working together I think is how I kind of deal with play I'm, I'm naturally a very curious person I have to know like how things work uh, so that's kind of how I envision like play in both like my work and just like life in general I think for me play was very attractive because when I was doing uh, my PhD at USC I was part of the interactive media and games kind of like division. That was kind of what I wanted to do because that's where like most people that were working with humans <laughs> like doing people uh, were. And I, th I think that it added the possibility for my activist work to like talk about different subjects and even serious subjects, but in a more like playful way. And also thinking about also the difference between representing something um, as like you just see it, but then when you're like actually experience it and how are you building like the system and how the system can also show how our actual systems work. <laughs> so I think, I think that's my main interest between play and interactivity. Um, and for me, you know, I go immediately to, that's actually one of the questions that is on my midterm for my intro to game studies class, <laughs> right, is to define play. Um, because in game studies, you know, it can be a more technical term. Um, and there are uh, lots of different ways to, to, that people define play, but the one that I, I tend to use in my classes is uh, free movement within a more rigid structure, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, that reminds me of all sorts of things. Um, and it, you know, in game studies um, and in my pedagogy, it's a way for me to get students to think about um, the system of enclosure that they're built into, first within a game, right? Because a lot of times we think about games as freedom and possibility and like all of these things, but actually what makes games fun is the lack of freedom and the things that they constrain you to do, right? Um, and so, you know, other game study scholars have used really interesting examples like golf, for example, would not be fun if the only goal was to put the ball in the hole. You could just walk over there and drop it. You have to do it with the stick, right? Um, and so it's the way that you are constrained in, in your, your possibility. It's another reason that I like um, Judith Butler's approach to gender trouble, right? Gender is only fun because there are all these things that tell us what gender is and how it's supposed to be. Um, and so my sort of like playful encounters with gender, especially when I was younger and not ready to be out like as trans or whatever, um, I always found that through like costuming, right? Like going to costume parties, I dress up, you know, like a secret service agent or, you know, like having all of these, these sort of like playful um, embodiments. Um, so, yeah. Um, so in the classroom, and this was um, inspired by some of your uh, toolkit, um, how do students respond to critical making? Why or how do they find value in this practice? Um, I will say that, again, I teach game design to students who have no even like faith in their ability to make games at all. Um, and so I think that's part of the valuable practice. At the beginning of, I teach a game, uh, a, a course that's called um, it's basically a game designed for social justice. And I, I tell students at the very beginning, I was like, I want you to set your expectations. You're going to make really crappy games at the end of the semester. Um, I use a different word than that, but, <laughs> but I want you to embrace the like crappiness of your game because it's not going to be super polished. It's probably not going to be very good, but you're going to love it because you created it. Um, and like in the context of the classroom and especially like at an institute, in like Georgetown where it's super like buttoned up kids who are very like trying to go to law school and they want to get the perfect grade and they just want to know how to do everything perfectly I, I get to tell them like no you're going to do it really badly and that's okay right like that's that's an important step towards becoming a creator is like letting go of that restriction on yourself that like this has to be something that's beautiful and perfect um, because nothing starts that way 
So at my previous institution that um, I was at, I think I kind of approached it with the kind of same mindset of like the thing that you make isn't going to be, it's it's not going to look like Call of Duty, it's not going to look like Zelda, but like the process of actually making it is what we're interested in, right? Because now that you know, yeah, I maybe need to a lot for more time or maybe I need to like do this thing differently and like I need to interrogate why do we have crunch or something like that. Um, so I always try to structure it so that they're um, a little less harsh on their self, especially because like my class is also one of the classes where like they actually get to do like funnier types of things, I suppose, besides like I don't know, studying for like the math thingy. Um, so, <laughs> so like just giving them like the freedom to like explore and be like, this piece maybe isn't the best, but like I had fun making it. So let's continue to make things that maybe aren't the best, but eventually it will get better. So. Yeah, for me, it's really interesting, the part of the critical and the making and the fact that um, at STAMS, I'm teaching both art and design students. And if you think about it, it's like kind of hard uh, to think about uh, cater to both of their needs. Um, so the possibility of using technology and criticizing technology and uh, sometimes a little bit like opening up the black box of how technology works or how you analyze like a video and how do you like, I think that's really important, but at the same time, I also try them to work on their intuition and what they think is right and how they feel uh, that what they want to communicate or what they want to do uh, works for them. And it's kind of like working towards their like general ethos of their work. So I think both of them are, are really important and the critical and the making. <laughs> Um, so I always find myself really curious about, um, and, and I think uh, all of you in some way touched upon this a little bit, and I wanted to offer a chance for expansion, but um, what do you see as like foundational media that inspires your work? So games that you've played that have really inspired your game creation or interactive media that has uh, inspired you to create. I guess I'm just curious who you see as your mentors or inspirations? So, I mean, I had the list of academics that, right, like I, I put in my presentation, but in terms of media and games, um, the games that inspired me to get into game studies, I've actually never written anything professionally about, which I find really fascinating and, and sort of wondering if that moment's going to come. Um, so one of them is, you know, I'm a child of the 90s, um, Final Fantasy VII, uh, the original one. And I remember finishing that game and just being like, I wanna do something with games when I grow up. Um, and at the time I didn't know if that was like making or whatever and it turned out I'm much better at like critique and of just like talking forever about like all of the implications or whatever, um, stuff that we do. Um, and so that was one of them. Uh, the other one is the Metroid series. So starting with like Super Metroid, which was on the Super Nintendo, and again, those, those sort of like 16-bit graphics, um, but it was such a rich, like beautiful world that I was just like completely immersed in it. Um, and I did, so for Metroid Prime, which came out for the GameCube, I think in 2001, um, I, that was my first like academic, like I wrote as an undergraduate, I wrote a paper on Metroid Prime. Um, and yeah, so I was baby, baby academic Amanda. I think for me, um, I have at least three games that like really inspired, like I want to make games when I get older, I suppose. Uh, so one of my first games I ever played was Spyro. I thought it was like the best game ever. I was like, a oh, purple dragon, this is great. So um, that was like a really good moment for me, uh, just playing that. And then I played games because my brothers played games and then like they just let me play for like 30 minutes, an hour, just like I'm playing my game and they kicked me off. Uh, so I really liked Spyro and then, you know, older brother, so I played GTA San Andreas, probably I was too young, but, you know, I really liked it. I was like, oh, the narrative is eating, but then, like, was it, you know, uh, so I really liked that game. It was one of the other games, one of the first ones I actually finished by myself, you know, uh, and then, um, finally, 
I really liked uh, fighting games growing up, like uh, Street Fighter, um, Dead or Alive, those types of games. They make me really angry, so I don't make those types of games or like play them funnily enough. Um, but like that love of just being sucked into the world um, is where like those three kind of start. And then of course like girls go games, like the dress up games. I really liked. So yeah, yeah I think that at each one of my projects have like different inspirations. Like uh, for example, the Downtown Browns really had like. Choose your own adventure books, of course, like even more <laughs> retro than the games. But then like Purple Moon, uh, we were thinking about that when we made it. And then I also feel like some of my inspirations are outside of the game world, more like theater, escape rooms, and those kind of things that are like very um, immersive and um, experiential. Okay, so I did also want to open up uh, the opportunity for questions from the audience. So Journey has a microphone here. And so if you have any questions for our lovely panelists, um, if nobody has a hand. question, I have a question for Tony. Oh, about all right. yeah, as you're <laughs> can we your throw question, a question for yeah, you? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> right. About the play in your work and how it kind of like feats like similar to the question that you gave us about play and games yeah so i also approach game design from like for students who are not necessarily programmers um uh, i approach it from analog gaming board game design um because it happens to be a lovely trojan horse for like good document design and technical writing <laughs> um and is is accessible um and uh I think that the, the thing that I value most in play is that it is a space for experiencing failure in a way that isn't going to necessarily be so high stakes. So I try to design my all of my courses, but especially the game design courses in a way that um, is forgiving, allows for generative failure. There are plenty of options for uh, doing a retry, experimenting. Um, and I think that students appreciate that opportunity um, to be playful themselves, to step back from the high stakes nature of testing and assessment. Um, and I think the other thing that I, I really value is in uh, interactivity and being able to experience a system and uh, understand the arguments it's making about the world uh, through playing with it. If I do this, what happens? If I do that, what happens? And what does that mean for how I move through the world? Can I be more thoughtful about how I interact with the world um, after you know, doing this little microcosm of experience? And I think there's something really powerful in that. Um, so that would be, Thank yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I think we have a question, yeah? Yes, um, uh, I guess that's a question. Um, the, someone described to me a game that they play over and over again that they refer to as FIO or figure it out. Like the sense that, that part of playing a game is also figuring out how to play the game or part of creating the system is figuring out how to create the system. And so you're, you're playing a game on a couple levels, right? Not just the thing itself, but the mastery or the decision not to make mastery of that. And I would love anyone's comments on, on that as an idea. I saw some nodding, so. Yeah, I'll say that's one of the reasons I teach game design around social justice topics um, and you know a mentor of mine at UC Davis once said like once you ask students to create a game about X problem in society um, they start asking all the right questions because they're trying to figure out what leads to this what leads to this how is this sort of like complex like because social issues are so complex there there's not really like one sort of like thing that is the problem and you got to figure out how different um, sort of aspects of a problem feed into that system. Um, and it, it, it's, so it's really great for getting students to think systemically, um, which like sometimes, you know, as somebody who teaches also feminist and queer and critical race theory, sometimes students can get so caught up in identity and like sort of personal experience and that sort of thing that they miss the fact that identities are actually part of a system of recognition um, that we all sort of like engage in together. Um, and so I like, I like gaming for these problems because gaming is about broad 
um, sort of like systemic things um, in complex issues. Yeah, um, I definitely agree with that. I think that, especially in my classes as well, whenever um, we get to like a issue, like was mentioned, very complex, like being very playful with that and within like the system helps um, them be able to like push and pull some of the parts that don't feel as malleable sometimes. Um, and then my other answer to the question, I love replaying games. So like the first, that's why I made that face. Uh, the first <laughs> game that I like really, really re liked replaying was like Skyrim, which I know, old game. But um, uh, I don't know, it's, there's something special that happens when you can replay a game and then like interrogate a little bit more and that's where like my love for like fandom studies and like fan fiction comes into because it's like what are the fans saying like what other like layer can we explore with that um so yeah i think uh, being able to replay a game and having like another like um narrative experience with it something interesting happens there that i really like to play with so yeah yeah, I was thinking of like playing with people too, like with others and how that turns into like a different experience when you like replay like different games and conversations that spark are different too. Um, also a mentor of mine would say that media is a pretext for context. So like the possibility of using this, any type of artifact that you're in, in front of you for us to have a conversation, uh, I think it's, it also made me think of also your answer of play. <laughs> Uh, Diamond, my spouse, was absolutely mortified to hear Skyrim be described as old. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Hi, thank you so much for a lovely, lovely panel. Um, I have a question particularly for, Di for, for Diamond Beverly Porter. Um, I, was really struck, I was really struck by the point, uh, a point in your presentation talking about making games that sort of like interact with sort of anyone, but sort of like really require sort of like a, a sort of literacy in black culture to sort of fully, full, fully get a full immersive experience. So I was curious to hear more about, and from the pan everyone on the panel as well, curious like how, is, so like how are you sort of negotiating opacity with sort of interact interactivity in play? Mm -hmm. So you're asking, um, how is black culture translated into like my work? Or can you repeat it one more time? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Oh, oh yes, of course. Oh yeah. I think I'm, I think I'm interested. Like how sort of like th how are you how are you sort of thinking about sort of interacting and play with game with sort of game design game design while also oh. sort of navigating sort of like navigating opacity like sort of like thinking about like themes of opacity thinking about like what does it mean for something to be interactable with sort of any audience but sort of like there's like sort of like a deeper richer experience sort of exper experience experience with black folks playing the, black folks playing the game. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, so whenever I, um, so first whenever I make like a game or something, it always comes to like my experience and then I like gain the influence from like my community and stuff. So um, with that, I always um, do like a whole bunch of research and research looks different. So sometimes it's like reading a whole bunch of like the like frameworks and books and stuff. But then oftentimes it is just revisiting media that has like a really, really significant like part or portion of me. Uh, so like a, a lot of times when I was making affirmations 2.0, like I watched the color purple a whole bunch. Cause like as you, oh, well, when, when we play the video, you'll see like purple, like the color is like really important. Some of the other aesthetic choices, like I love Spyro. So like the game aesthetics is also like present there. So like that whole research process is just like another like deep dive back into like, what makes Diamond Diamond? What things do I like? And there were also a whole bunch of like these really important points in like the creation of the game. Cause the game took like about two years to make where I had to like take a week or two off. I was like, oh, this kind of hurts to like make this or like to code this like NPC who like maybe, we don't have the best relationship anymore like there's a significant point in the game or like in my life that's just like oh it's a, it's a hurt point let's pause on that um so i guess uh being really critical of not just like the creation of the game but like my experiences and my reaction to it is also a part of like the critical making process of um my game design um and then i'm sorry i'm trying to remember the second question mm. Yeah, sorry. I think, I, think, I, think, I, think covers, I think it covers everything. But I also oh, okay. Everything. I, was, I, I wanted everything. to answer yeah. it like really well. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else like to ask a question? I, I guess it was something that Amanda said that made me think of this first, um, but I'd love to hear what everyone 
has to say about this. Um, one of the aspects that you talked about of gamer trouble was ecological, and I was curious how to hear you expand on your thoughts on that and how that intersects with the other themes that everyone's been talking about, about gender and power and identity. Yeah. Um, admittedly, this is something that I, I don't do as well as the other topics, sort of in my, um, in the classroom in particular. And really, I bring it up in part just to sit with the, the discomfort that it brings, um, right? The, the sort of like fact that we know that even in this, or especially because of the society that's so computer dependent and so so dependent on these particular technologies um, that are actually destroying the world, right? Like pollution, not just like the, the sort of like physical world in terms of pollution, in terms of extracting resources, et cetera, but also the human cost of those things, right? toxic materials that are, um, you know, if we're recycling electronics, some worker in often like Southeast Asia or East Africa or whatever, like these laborers are diving into our toxic trash, right? Um, to, to make them sort of like safer or whatever. Um, all of the conflict that goes with mining minerals that are, um, you know, required for um, the production of, of computer technology. Like there's an entire system underneath this very sort of like clean, exciting, you know, these products that do make life better and easier and, and more exciting for a lot of us. Um, but I think we miss, we miss that like broader um, cost. Uh, I, I don't know how to address that um, in any way that's like meaningful because it is such a huge, like you're, you're tackling like global economics at that point, right? Like, um, and so, you know, there are folks who do work on that. And so one of my approaches is to try to like introduce students to like the folks who are, are looking at those things. Um, but a lot of times I find students aren't even aware, like they don't even like think about it because we're meant to think like, this little box is, is very clean. It has very clean lines, it, you know, we're, it's very slick and, and we're not supposed to understand everything else that goes on in, in and around it. Um, so yeah, I, I sort of like open the problem to them, but I, I have no way of approaching a solution at this point. I also like, I don't have enough like words to um, expand on it in like a really contextual way, but I fully recognize that um, the production of like games and like the technologies, they're not like just singular, like they just don't show up at our doorstep. Um, so one of the ways in my own work, I kind of approach it in a small way, of course, I still need to expand on it, of course, but is just one interrogating like the creation process of a game and like making sure that, especially for Affirmations 2.0, I made sure I didn't fall into crunch because that would have been real bad. Um, or just like um, playing with like the way that we structure like design creation. So how do we like create a game? How do we create or like write? Do you write in rest days? Why is that revolutionary? We should have time to rest. Uh, so I guess the like human centricness uh, of my career practice kind of shifts a little bit that way, but I am fully like still working through and like pushing through what does it mean to like design like a computer game and like the how does the computer get here? So like still tracing that. So still in the like beginning stages of that kind of portion. Yeah, I think we all have like a love-hate relationship with technology, to be honest. Uh, but um, one of the things that I've been thinking about when the work with the feminist healing portals is how people who are like in territories in Central America, how are they thinking about the future in terms of ecological devastation and what kind of, yeah, what do they think we should be doing and kind of like trying to find space for that work and find space for those uh, ideas to like be part of my work or that can I can help uplift. So I think that's the only kind of thing that I can say about it. <laughs> I, I mean, it's it's really remarkable the level of like guilt and helplessness we feel and, and also like hypocrisy, right? Because I'll see, you know, people, so like with, with things like Bitcoin or AI, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that people start screaming as soon as this comes out is like, imagine the computational resources here, like this contributing to global warming, the, ener the you know, energy use, et cetera, et cetera. All of which is very true. And yet we're still really compelled by, you know, being able to type in, I don't know, like, uh, you know, Robotron in the style of, name an artist. 
<laughs> Picasso, right? <laughs> and 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 people can't resist, right? Like you can't resist playing with AI tools, even though they are extremely detrimental to the environment. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a big problem and new idea how to how to tackle it. I think even in the realm of like analog gaming, which we think of, I think as being sustainable or maybe like less environmentally impactful than video games, um, we're still most of those games are uh, being produced uh, in China. It deals with uh, multinational supply chains and shipping. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of, especially with Kickstarter, so many of these games are being deluxified with these, these giant boxes full of plastic that mm -hmm. um, are going to eventually, you hope, you know, you'll pass it on to friends or family or whatever, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, those are largely going to end up in a landfill at some point. Um, and so, like, one of the things I try to do is, like, challenge my students to think about what do we need to put in the box and what do people already have in their homes that we can, you know, make this maybe a little bit more DIY, maybe a little bit more inconvenient for the end user, but in a way that's going to make it more sustainable. Um, and that's really hard when you're trying to compete with these beautiful boxes of plastic. <laughs> um, do we have time for one more, or are we right should we wrap? Tony, there's one, one more right there. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. All right. So last one. Hello. Um, so I took a course this past year about literature and virtual reality and how they both experience similar revolutions of people arguing for them as empathy machines, as things that um, can describe or put you in the experiences of other people. So we read like Uncle Tom's Cabin and worked with uh, virtual realities that put you in the position of someone who has lost their job and has to become homeless and talked about does interacting with these technologies actually like provide empathy for these situations, even though you've never lived them, or are they just sort of informants? And so I guess my question is, when you are designing an interactive video game or an interactive piece of media, are you doing that to generate experience or empathy? And do you think those interactive mediums can be empathy machines? So whenever I for whenever I go about like making my games, um, it's gonna sound funny. Whenever I make them, I make them for me. So like it's like when I play this, do I like this? Uh, and then like later on in the development process is when like I'm kind of interrogating who's gonna play this and who who will gain entrance into like this little moment in like my life or like my world that I've created. So my games aren't intended for them to feel as young Diamond did in elementary school, I suppose. And uh, I wouldn't want them to feel that. Usually with my games, I want them to. Um, see this like specific setting that I experience, but not have them be like, I lived in the shoes of a young black girl, you know, like that's not how they should approach it. And it's also like, I make the game. I think of like my little niece who's going to play it and be like, Oh, Roll Bounce is on in the background. I watch that movie. So like those like cultural moments that like are intrinsic sometimes like black culture. I want them to have those moments that I didn't have when I was like playing video games to just walk around the world and be like, Oh, that's a really specific, like they're in the house with their shoes on. Why are they doing that like that type of like cultural moment in my games uh so uh i don't usually foreground with like the empathy of like you know i am first generation college student like my mom's single mom so i didn't don't want them to be like i know what it feels like for like single motherhood and like food wasn't in the fridge like that's not the standpoint it is like important in the game like you can notice it but it's not like the main goal i suppose I wrote an article that is online. You can read about it, a whole thing about against empathy. <laughs> but basically what I was thinking of when we were doing the work that it was about women of color, that we didn't want people to be empathetic, but instead to have like kind of what um, Amanda was talking about, also Manichi, like these intimate moments in which you're acknowledging my subjectivity and you're not like owning my shoes, kind of <laughs> what you're saying, but we can walk together and we can maybe have some sort of coalition solidarity building together. So that's kind of, I'm kind of more like a um, more intimacy instead of empathy. That's 
where I have got it in my thinking. And the other thing that I think when I do any type of experiences, especially the ones that are community-based, is like, how do I think first this for the community? And then maybe we can do another circle that is like the exterior audience. And maybe there could be another circle that is like the international audience. So, so, so think about it like in concentric circles of audience and how they would, and think about how designing for each specific audience too, like because each audience can have a different experience depending on the knowledge they have, the cultural background. So those are kind of like my two takes on the empathy conversation that is very, is still like very prevalent in all like interactive media discourse and thinking. Mm -hmm. It's still like, it's out there, right? <laughs> yeah, it's out there. And it was, a, I mean, it was a big conversation within the trans gaming community as well, right? Um, to the extent that like there was that project that Maddie Bryce did where you have to touch her body in order to play the game um, in part again to acknowledge that like there's a lot more to this embodiment than what you see on the screen. Um, another fun project uh, was done by a creator known as Anna Anthropy who created this game called Dysphoria years ago um, that was a sensation on the internet for a minute and it was about her experience accessing um, hormone replacement therapy and people wrote about it so much as a game that helped cis folks understand what it meant to be trans that she took it offline. She literally said, like, this is not what this game was about. I'm removing this. Please don't talk about this anyway, uh, about this. Um, and she did another experience that I think was also called Empathy Machine, um, where in a in an in-person gallery in New York, um, she had a treadmill and a pair of her boots um, and the game was, you get a point for every literal mile you walk in her shoes <laughs> in the game. So you put her boots on, walk on this treadmill, and you can get a point for walking a mile on the treadmill in the gallery, right? And that's a sort of like satirical take on, do you think that moving through the motions when you can return to your body that then fits more seamlessly into society than mine does? Like, do you really think this little vacation in this virtual world tells you anything about what it means to walk through a space in which you're not welcome, right? Um, and so, yeah, there's been a lot of response from artists in particular on like, no, <laughs> that's not what this is. Um, and, and don't try to do that. Um. Okay, so now I believe we got the technical issues sorted. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Um, and then also, can we just give a round of applause to Tony, Amanda, Diamond, Amelia, thank you so much for this amazing, yeah, these presentations. Um, and then also to just to say, if we can just maybe if, if you have um, just a few minutes, I would love to see if we can get maybe at least a, one of each of the videos working. Um, and then of course, right after this, please don't go, there is like, food and cake and editing that's going to be happening, DJ um, right next door. But let's see if we can get these videos. I'll wait till the... <laughs> oh. I don't know. It says it's. All right, I'm going to turn off the Wi Fi and just try it. All right, hold on one second.
I know. I'm so Oops. You can also play them Okay. Yeah. It says it's connected, so I don't know. Isn't is that are you reading that it's connected? Oh now it looks like it's connecting again. Yeah, I think it's about Okay. We can pull them up on some of the other computers in there. They've set up like four library computers. Okay, so we're coming out, we've come up with a new plan <laughs> for this since we're still having some issues. So we are going to set the videos up on some computers in this room so that we can watch them. Because um, I would also love to see them too. And yeah, play stuff. Amazing. <laughs> love it. So please, um, again, one more round of applause for our special guest today. <laughs> Wonderful. And please join us next door. Thank you so much for coming. So weird. No, I think we're okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I know now it's not working, but I should have turned on my hot spot. Oh, we want to grab everybody.